The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Tamara Bingham Noyes. I'm the Director of Business Development here at Center for Change. Uh, you can't see me at the moment. We're having a little bit of internet issues here, and we were when we were practicing just ahead of this, uh, the sound was cutting out a little bit on my end. And so I uh, stopped the camera in hopes that that maybe helps with the connectivity a little bit better. So hopefully you can hear me all right. And we're going to um, proceed and cross our fingers and hope that the internet gods smile on us today and we're able to get through the presentation uh, without any connection issues. So we're so happy to have you here. As I said, I'm Tamara Bingham Noyes. I'm the Director of Business Development here at Center for Change. If you're not familiar with Center for Change, we're an eating disorder program in Utah, just outside of Salt Lake City. Uh, we have all levels of care here at the center, inpatient, residential, partial, IOP, and outpatient. We treat uh, women and girls, females in overnight care in, in inpatient and residential, and all genders in partial and uh, IOP. So, Shelly, I'm getting a, a text that I'm breaking up here and there, but can still be understood. So I'm going to keep going, but if it gets worse, I'll just let you jump in if you would, please. Um, I, I'm so excited to have Dr. Heather, Dr. Heather Finley here with us today. Uh, Heather will turn her camera on in just a minute and you'll get a chance to see her as well as hear from her. Um, we're thrilled to have Heather with us. She's an amazing person and an incredible clinician. She's a registered dietitian. Heather has a doctorate in clinical nutrition. She specializes in gut health, <clears throat> excuse me, specializes in gut health and uh, just does an incredible job with that. And I'm so happy that you're able to hear from her today. This is part two of our four-part presentation with Heather. Um, just a couple of, of things before I turn it over to Heather. We're going to, I wanna do a couple of um, quick housekeeping items that you should see on your screen. A copy of the PowerPoint is in the handout section of the toolbar. Um, you're welcome to take a look at that if you need to. You can also download it to, to review later. There's also a copy of the PowerPoint on our uh, website uh, under the, the webinars tab. So you are welcome to find it there as well. A copy of the post test is in the handout section of the toolbar. Please keep in mind this is for reference only. Uh, you're welcome to look at it and keep an eye on those test questions as the uh, presentation proceeds. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, then I will give you more information about that, but you'll take the test online in order to receive continuing education credit. You're welcome to submit questions in the questions section of the toolbar. We'll try to get to a few of those at the end of the webinar, so feel free to type those questions in. I'll keep an eye on them throughout the webinar, and then we'll address them at the end. When the webinar ends, please fill out the evaluation that pops up at the end. It just takes about 30 seconds. It gives us really good information that we then tabulate and send to the continuing education providers. And that information is confidential. So you're more than welcome to be uh, uh, open and honest about how you feel about how the webinar went. And then about an hour after the webinar ends, you'll receive a separate email with the link to take the online post test. And I'll review that again at the end of the presentation. So Heather, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you, would you turn on your camera? Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Perfect. I, I know we were having some, um, some sound issues, but hopefully folks could hear those instructions okay. And if not, I'll repeat them at the end. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you, Heather. So hang tight. Okay. All right, it's coming your way. All right, can everyone hear me and see me? Hopefully that is the case. That looks good, think... Heather, I can hear you and see you. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my mic, but if you need me, holler back. Okay, great. Welcome everyone. Um, this is part two of a four part series of the gut brain connection. Um, I am so glad you're here. Don't fret if you were not here for part one. I believe that Center for Change has the recording on their website. So you can definitely go back and listen to that. 
I will be referring to pieces that we discussed um, from part one today. So definitely check that out if you haven't. All these webinars are building on each other. So if you can't make part three, but you can make part four, be sure to check out the recording of that one as well. Um, because we're walking through the gut brain connection from start to finish. And really part four is focused on the application. So I'm obviously going to give you ways to apply this today, um, but we're going to sum it all up. Um, part four, thank you guys so much for all the amazing questions from last time. Um, pages of questions. I loved them. So I'm trying to sprinkle those in the next couple presentations as well. And for sure, part four will make sure I include a lot of those questions also. So um, we will get started. So I'm Dr. Heather Finley. If you weren't here last time, I'll do a brief intro. I am a registered dietitian. My doctorate is in clinical nutrition. I have experience in clinical settings, in outpatient treatment, now virtual private practice. I'm based in Dallas, Texas. Very happy to report that it is 70 degrees warmer this week than it was last week. So if you're from Texas, um, I feel your pain from last week um, and hope you're safe. I am a gut health expert. I focused my doctorate training on gut brain research, but really the reason that I am so interested in gut health is because of my own experience with gut issues for 20 plus years. That's really driven my passion for this as well as the disconnect that I saw when I was treating eating disorder patients who had lots of digestive issues, mood issues, et cetera. And so wanted to figure out how to bridge the gap um, between kind of like the wellness culture that we live in of super restrictive diets um, and the eating disorder world and trying to blend the two where people aren't having to do these crazy extreme things to um, improve their digestion, I knew there had to be a better way. So I'm excited to share some of that with you today. So today we are going to first talk about the different communication pathways between the gut and the brain. We're also going to talk a lot about the nervous system. Um, and then lastly, we are going to talk about how stress impacts the gut. Um, stress will be kind of a long-standing theme of all of these webinars because stress really is at the root of so much of this because of the gut-brain connection. Okay, so just a quick recap from last session. So last session we talked about how digestion works. We went through top to bottom all the different organs that are involved in digestion and went through all the places that digestion can malfunction um, and some of the reasons for those. We also talked about dysbiosis. And just as a refresher, dysbiosis is an imbalance of good and bad bacteria in your gut. You have several pounds of bacteria in your digestive tract and all over your body. So dysbiosis is an imbalance in the good guys and the bad guys. We also talked a lot about stomach acid, why stomach acidity is so important for preventing dysbiosis, why stomach acidity is so important for proper digestion, um, and some reasons why stomach acid could be low. We talked about the importance of short-chain fatty acids for gut health. Um, and just as a refresher on that, short-chain fatty acids are byproducts of fermentation in the gut. So when your gut bugs, your, your good guys, eat fiber, prebiotic fiber, they produce short chain fatty acids like butyrate, and they are anti-inflammatory to the gut, anti-inflammatory to the brain, and have a huge say in mental health. And then we wrapped it up by identifying trends in eating disorder patients. Okay, so, our digestive system is way more complex than we used to think. Often in the past, we would separate these two organs, the gut and the brain, thinking that they had nothing to do with each other, they were separate. But the reality is that your resident gut microbes influence your emotions, even your pain sensitivity, and even your social interactions. 
So when you have a mood disorder, it doesn't just exist in the brain. And we'll be walking through a lot of research on this, um, especially part three. But the gut and the brain are BFFs. They want to get along and you want them to get along because when they do, everything functions better. So here are three ways that your gut and your brain talk. The first way is through the vagus nerve. So as a refresher from last time, the vagus nerve connects the gut and the brain. Your gut is lined with the enteric nervous system and your vagus nerve is a very, very dense nerve. It has more nerve endings than the spinal cord and the vagus nerve directly connects these two centers. So what goes on in your brain goes on in your gut and vice versa. It's a bi-directional pathway and they're in constant communication with each other. The next way is through your immune system. So your immune system is mostly housed in your gut. Depending on what research you look at, 70 to 80 percent of your immune tissue is in your gut. Your immune system response is communicated to the brain from your gut. Um, a lot of research now on autoimmune disorders and how they're stemming from the gut and how improving digestive health can actually improve autoimmune um, response. And then lastly, through neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are small molecules that are actually made in the gut and they are directly absorbed into your blood or your circulatory system through your gut lining. I'll, I'll get into this more later, but your gut is responsible for producing a lot of the neurotransmitters that are helpful for mood. Um, and we'll talk also about serotonin and how it affects gut motility. So neurotransmitters. Over 30 neurotransmitters are in the gut. 90 to 95% of your serotonin is made in your gut. Serotonin is a calming hormone. It's responsible for mood, um, good mood. And 50% um, of your dopamine is made in the gut. This is an excitatory hormone. And both of these, or all of the neurotransmitters that are produced in your gut, have an impact on your mood, your energy, um, even your gut motility, like I mentioned earlier. And the amazing part of this is there are actually certain probiotic strains that are involved in the production of neurotransmitters. The research is changing every single day on this, but there's lots of really good research about different probiotic strains, where you can find them, especially even in foods, um, and how they help with neurotransmitter production. Okay, so the main communication pathways are the enteric nervous system, which is your gut, and then your autonomic nervous system. This is where we're gonna camp out for the most part today. So I wanna just kind of set the stage with these two pathways and what they do and why they are important. So your enteric nervous system oversees the functions of your GI tract, your gastrointestinal tract. It's responsible for the neuroendocrine system, the microbiome, the migrating motor complex. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, it makes neurotransmitters and vitamins, and as we touched on last time, the more diverse your enteric nervous system is in regards to bacteria, the better. And your enteric nervous system also makes the short-chain fatty acids that stimulate serotonin release. Your autonomic nervous system consists of both your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and digest, and then your sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight. And both of these nervous systems are very essential to our, su our survival. For the most part, people tend to camp out in the sympathetic state way too much in our busy, busy culture. So we end up in fight or flight a lot. Um, and I'll talk in a bit about how that affects digestion specifically but your autonomic nervous system is extremely important for digestion, heart rate, your respiratory rate, sexual arousal, and urination. And both of these, the, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system will affect these differently, 
Um, I'm gonna show you a really cool visual. systems, um, how when you have an emotion or a stressful situation, it's going directly to the gut. Um, I'm going to get more in depth on this in a second, but any stressful situation, um, stress even from under eating, over exercising, or stress from a big meeting, a, br a big presentation, um, whatever it is, directly affects the gut. Um, by cortisol as well as through the vagus nerve. Um, it affects gut motility, it affects immunity, it affects gut permeability, and then it also affects the mucus lining of the gut. So I love this visual, just kind of breaking it down, um, and we'll get into this a little bit more. This is one of my favorite visuals. They do such a good job of just showing exactly what happens when you are in a rest and digest state and a fight or flight state. When you are in a rest and digest state, which is ideally the state you are in a lot of the time, you have adequate saliva production, your heartbeat is slower, you have stomach acidity that is adequate for digesting food, um, it, inhibits, it, it inhibits the release of glucose and stimulates the gallbladder for digestion. It also stimulates the activity of your intestines your intestines contract, that's called peristalsis, and that's what moves food and waste through your digestive system. When you are in a fight or flight state, this inhibits salivation, it increases heart rate, and it inhibits the acidity of the stomach, um, inhibits the gallbladder, which is very important for bile, for digesting fat. Um, it inhibits the activity of the intestine, so it can slow your intestinal peristalsis down. I don't have the visual in this presentation, but there's a great visual um, that I've seen that actually shows how each emotion affects stomach acidity and gut movement. Um, it shows fear, anger, and I think, uh, fear, anger, and I think stress. Um, and it shows exactly what's going on as far as increasing stomach acid, decreasing stomach acid. Um, I'm happy to send that picture to Tamara to, to send out. It's really interesting um, looking at it. But as far as applying this to your clients, this is a great visual to show someone who's struggling with digestive issues because if you can't get into a rest and digest state, this is going to greatly affect how your body actually digests and absorbs nutrients from your food, which then affects your digestive system. So showing this to your clients might help to spark interest in this. We talked a little bit last time about just sitting down, calming down for a meal, um, allowing adequate salivation before eating, chewing really well, this is a great way to um, improve the rest and digest system um, so your clients can eat their food, not have as many digestive symptoms, and then not have the effects later of not digesting food. Um, so save this, show it to your clients. Um, the migrating motor complex. I talked about this last time, but just as kind of a refresher, this is your small intestines dishwasher. It clears out undigested food from your GI tract. It's that noisy, gurgly feeling that most people don't want to happen in the middle of a meeting. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's your stomach whooshing fluid through to allow for um, clearing things out. 
This can kick in up to 90 minutes after a meal. It can take about three hours to complete. Um, and it needs to happen multiple times a day. Otherwise, there's food sitting in the intestines that's not getting digested or adequately absorbed. And this can greatly impact constipation and gut function. So why this applies to communication pathways? If your communication pathway is primarily a fight or flight response, this migrating motor complex is not going to be able to do its job. It doesn't show up and there's lots of food sitting in the digestive tract, not adequately digested and absorbed and can lead to other digestive issues down the road. Okay. Mm -hmm. The oh Tamara, I'm hearing some feedback. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, Heather. I think somebody's unmuted, so I will figure that out and take care of it. Okay, I just want to make sure it wasn't on my end. Okay, the HPA axis. This is your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This is how the body responds to stress. This is part of a communication pathway because your brain communicates with your gut. And if your brain is constantly stressed, sending signals to your adrenals to produce cortisol, it is going to affect the gut. So this can be from both physical stress or mental stress. Um, stress can come in so many different forms. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it can come in the form of under eating, overtraining, um, even inconsistent meals, fasting all day, binging at night, um, anything that is not consistent to the body can be a stress to the body. So we find that in major depression, blood plasma cortisol and corticotropin releasing factor in the cerebral spinal fluid are elevated. And when the body it has too much cortisol, of course, this is going to affect the gut. So chronic stress can lead to gut imbalances. Like I mentioned on the previous slide, it shuns this migrating motor complex function, um, which affects the clean out of the intestines, can cause lots of fermentation in the digestive tract, lots of gut symptoms like bloating, constipation, even diarrhea. So the gut-brain connection is regulated by the vagus nerve. Um, there's something called the dorsal vagal complex. This connects all the organs underneath your diaphragm. Um, this is a bi-directional pathway as well to the gut and the brain. Um, and activation of the vagus nerve leads to the release of something called acetylcholine. This stimulates muscle contractions uh, when you're in a parasympathetic state or a rest and digest state. So the vagus nerve provides innervation for swallowing, even vocalization. Um, it also helps with heart rate and can reduce your heart rate, but stimulates contraction of the muscles in the intestines. Um, like I mentioned earlier, peristalsis is the contraction of the intestinal muscles so you can move food and waste through so you can have a bowel movement. And it's also responsible for digestion, heart rate, respiratory rate, um, and even reflex reactions. So the vagus nerve is a key player here. Um, the vagus nerve can talk to the gut and cause digestive symptoms. Um, and the digestive symptoms that you're having can talk to the brain and cause mood-related symptoms as well. Um, and a lot of that has to do with gut bacteria, but also has to do with stress. So often we end up with this chicken or egg scenario. Did the stress happen first or did the digestive symptoms happen first? And oftentimes there's not a clear answer, but addressing it on both ends is really important, which is why having a multidisciplinary team um, therapist, dietitian, doctor, et cetera, is very helpful because we need to address this um, from all angles. So stress in the vagus nerve. Um, if you remember the visual that I showed you earlier, when you are in a parasympathetic state, this helps with bowel motility, it helps with salivation, uh, your saliva even has enzymes that help you digest your food. 
when you're in a sympathetic state, it is going to reduce blood flow specifically to the gut and to your muscles. If your body thinks it's being chased by a bear, it is not worried about digesting food. It's worried about running away from this supposed bear, um, which means more blood flow to your heart, to your muscles, et cetera. So think about how much stress your patients are under, whether they've had trauma in the past. We're gonna talk specifically about the research on trauma in the gut next time. Um, but just think about all the areas they could be stressed. They may have had past trauma. They may be under eating. They may be over exercising. Maybe they are going some days without eating, some days binging. Um, maybe they're in a stressful relationship. Eating in general is stressful for them. So getting out of the sympathetic state is hard. Um, so working with your patients to explain to them what the difference between these is and giving them some tools oh sorry i think i got muted um so giving your patients the tools to um calm themselves down allow themselves to relax specifically when they're eating a meal um, can greatly, greatly help improve their digestion. And as you'll see later, also improve their gut microbiome um, and their overall uh, gut brain connection. So the vagus nerve and the enteric nervous system. Your enteric nervous system is an intestinal barrier that, like I mentioned earlier, regulates your immune response. It actually detects nutrients from food it helps with motility, um, it helps with fluids, ions, etc. And it connects the emotional and cognitive areas um, of the intestines. So immune activation, intestinal permeability. Um, this is what a lot of people term leaky gut. Um, by the way, leaky gut is not a thing, um, but it is that is what intestinal permeability is, when the lining of the intestine is broken apart um, and is also responsible for enteric refluxes. So to sum it all up, the gut-brain axis includes the brain, the spinal cord, the autonomic nervous system, both your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system, your enteric nervous system, and your HPA axis. So I want to show you a picture in a second on how these things communicate with each other, but um, you'll see on the picture the vagal efferent signals send messages down to the gut from the brain, and the vagal afferent signals send messages up. And it's about 10 to 20 percent of messaging down and 80 to 90 percent messaging up. I really like this visual showing how everything is connected. So this, the signals from the gut send signals like inflammation, satiety, satiation of meals, even energy, metabolism. So all these signals from the gut are going up to the brain and the brain is sending signals down to the gut um, for secretion of acid, digestive enzymes, as well as gastric capacity. So like how much room is there for food? Um, so there's a lot more information coming from the gut to the brain than there actually is from the brain to the gut, um, but they both work together. Okay, so this vagal afferent pathway actually activates your HPA access um, through corticotropin releasing factor from the hypothalamus in your brain. Um, and this can affect adaptive responses, um, environmental stress, as well as cytokines that can be inflammatory. Um, I, I put it out on a visual here just so you can kind of see how everything is working together. But at the end of the day, what is happening is stress is causing the hypothalamus to talk to the pituitary gland, talk to the adrenal glands, and cortisol is produced. Cortisol is circulating around in the blood, 
um, cortisol is then affecting gut function, brain function, um, stress adaptation, et cetera. So how this directly affects the microbiome? It directly impacts the neuroendocrine system, metabolic symptoms, but it also influences anxiety and depressive-like behaviors because of how the HPA axis works with this whole system. So it's going to increase your stress response. Your gut bacteria actually will influence stress reactivity and can actually regulate the set point for stress, um, which is not a good thing. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the call, we live in a very stressful environment. So our plates are very full. I think it's kind of a, a common um, badge of honor for people to be really stressed, be really busy, um, and we have to think about how long-term that's actually affecting everything going on in our digestive system, in our gut, and then um, therefore affecting our brain as well. So this is specific to food intake. Um, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because I don't wanna run out of time, but your gut is communicating with your brain. Your brain is communicating with your gut. Your, your gut is telling your brain how much food it needs. Um, and your brain is then sensing that. Um, and there are hormones involved with this. So the three that we'll really hone in on are CCK, um, cholecystokinin, ghrelin, and leptin. So all three of these hormones are very responsible for how much food we eat, how hungry we are, um, nutrient content of the food, and um, make us feel satisfied after a meal. However, these can become disrupted um, with consistent stress, um, as well as experiences with food. So CCK specifically, this regulates your GI function. It actually helps with gastric emptying, which I know many of your clients probably struggle with. Um, it regulates food intake. It helps with the pancreas. Um, it also helps with gastric acid production. And as a result of eating protein, you release CCK from your small intestines. So short chain fatty acids activate this system. Um, and this is going to affect the rate at which you empty food, how much food you eat, um, and also how you are digesting food. Ghrelin and leptin are two other important hormones. Ghrelin is going to regulate your food intake. I always think of this like, grr, your stomach is growling. Ghrelin is a hunger hormone. Um, it's increased by fasting. It falls after a meal. Um, and you can regulate food intake. Um, it, it helps your body to regulate food intake. Then leptin, um, there are receptors also identified in the vagus nerve. So leptin is a fullness hormone. It works with CCK to tell your brain that it's full. So what you need to know about this is when there is significant dysfunction with your gut-brain connection, in your vagus nerve, it will inhibit and it will disable some of these hormones from adequately doing their job. So if you think about this in regards to some of the clients that you work with who don't have hunger signals, don't have fullness signals, they're all over the place, um, this can actually go back to the gut-brain connection um, in that their brain and their gut are maybe both communicating with each other negatively. So again, chicken or egg scenario, what happened first? We don't know. We want to address it from all angles. Uh, we'll specifically talk um, in part three and four more nutritionally, some things that you can do to help with this. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about vagus nerve, just simple things that you can do at the end as well. So gut sensations like fullness, nausea, discomfort, 
um, even feelings of well-being. Um, I always tell my clients, food is is nutritious, obviously, but sometimes the experience of eating is nutritious as well. If you are enjoying a meal with people you love, if you are enjoying a meal um, and it brings great memories, this is also nourishing to the body in a completely different way. And your gut notices that, takes note on it, and your brain stores that as information. So these gut reactions that we can have as a result of positive or negative responses with food um, send signals to the brain. These feelings can be stored and we later access these when we're making decisions about food. So our gut helps us with what to eat, who to spend time with, um, how to assess this information. Um, so again, food is way more, is food is nourishing, but the experience as well um, helps. And that is something that you can work on with your patients also, is how do you bring back positive experiences with food so these are stored in your brain and they're not sitting down to eat with a fear food or something they've had a negative experience in the past um, having another negative experience. So working on training their brain, calming their nervous system down before eating, having positive mealtime experiences can make a huge, huge difference um, in just digestion and absorption, gut symptoms that they might have um, after eating, um, and can then uh, snowball into things later. So we will get into this as well, part three and four, all the nitty gritty about your gut microbes, but you have 100,000 times more microbes in your gut alone as there are people on earth, which is so crazy. So most of this we just have known in the last decade. Um, so I'm super excited just how this continues to grow and change over the next decade um, and 20, 30 years from now. But your microbes in your gut actually help with digestion. Your microbes can actually digest some foods better than you. Um, so having a diverse population of gut microbes is so essential for digestion. And when you have disturbances in your gut microbes, there is research showing that this is associated with inflammatory bowel disease, diarrhea, even autism, um, neurodegenerative brain disorders, et cetera. Um, and so one thing that I always tell my clients is the best way to have a diverse gut microbiome is the variety of food you eat. Um, so think about this in the context of our patients. They likely eat a very limited amount of foods. Um, they have a lot of off limits or fear foods. This long term affects their gut microbes and over time continues to snowball in the way that they can digest food um, in how their brain communicates with their gut and their gut communicates with their brain because the more diversity you have in your gut, the better everything functions, um, even including digestion. So I mentioned this earlier, intestinal permeability. That's what a lot of people know as leaky gut. Again, leaky gut is not a thing, um, but there's this company called Microbiome Labs. They have a really good visual on their site that I copied um, and put on here. So this is just showing what can happen. Uh, when the gut microbiome is disturbed, it degrades this mucosal barrier of the gut. And this is your epithelial lining. Your gut lining is one cell thick. It's not very big. So it's somewhat easy to disturb this gut lining, especially with repeated stress. Um, also, really, really restrictive diets, um, long-term starvation, this can affect the gut microbiome. So, inflammatory particles, bad bacteria is breaking open these tight junctions of these epithelial cells, leaking through and causing your immune system to be on high alert. So, if you were ever wondering what leaky gut is, um, again, it's not a thing. 
but increased intestinal permeability is. And so this is showing exactly what's happening. These inflammatory particles leaking through, causing your immune system on high alert, um, creating something called endotoxins. The most common endotoxin is LPS or lipopolysaccharide. Um, and when it's found up here in your intestinal lumen, it's not super harmless, but once it is released into the bloodstream, it can be inflammatory and actually cross the, the blood-brain barrier, um, affecting the gut-brain connection, mood, um, depression, and anxiety symptoms. So some reasons why this mucosal barrier can be broken down. Chronic alcohol consumption, chronic smoking, intense exercise, lack of sleep, NSAIDs, um, starvation, inconsistent eating, stress, and again, stress comes in many forms, mental, physical, emotional stress, um, antibiotics, um, and also just everything being antibacterial. We don't want to kill both good and bad bacteria. We want to kill the bad guys, um, but we want to have a diverse um, population of good bacteria in our gut. So here's uh, the other visual from that site that shows um, a good, healthy, strong mucosal barrier, preventing things from getting through, causing this disruption of the immune system in the gut. So I mentioned serotonin earlier. Serotonin is one of the primary neurotransmitters that is produced in the gut. And serotonin is extremely important for peristalsis or movement of food and waste and contraction of your intestinal muscles through your digestive symptoms. Um, sorry, your digestive system. This plays a role with sleep, also appetite, pain sensitivity. So one thing that you'll see is a lot of GI doctors are actually prescribing SSRIs for IBS-related symptoms. So why is that? It's because it's helping to improve serotonin levels, therefore improving gut peristalsis and movement of the gut. So that's one way that a lot of GI doctors or medical professionals will treat constipation is actually improving um, or, or prescribing antidepressants. So if our gut's sole responsibility was digestion, why does it contain these signaling symptoms? That is a great example of how they are connected. So here is a visual of what can happen if you refer back a couple of slides when I showed you the visual of intestinal permeability, inflammatory cytokines um, like LPS uh, leaking through the gut. When your body is under a lot of stress, if the gut microbiome is disrupted, there's lots of inflammation going on with the immune system in the gut, this can actually shunt the serotonin pathway. So you can see here how it will actually stress or infection increases this IDO enzyme and shunts the serotonin pathway and creates quinolinic acid. Um, there's lots of really interesting research about this, but um, anytime there is gut disruption, Muted. happen, which is why it, gut symptoms often result with mood symptoms and vi vice versa, because adequate serotonin levels are not being produced in the gut um, as a result of increased intestinal permeability, endotoxins like LPS, etc. So things that are crossing the blood-brain barrier that shouldn't your immune system is basically educating itself what's foreign, what's not, and your immune system in your gut is really suspicious and paranoid. So it wants to shut down anything that's causing harm. Um, ultimately, this decreases production of postbiotics, those short chain fatty acids that I talked about that are anti-inflammatory to the brain. Um, and then quinolinic acid is an excitotoxin, um, in the central nervous system. So if you've ever had a patient that has done one of those food sensitivity tests and they come back and they have like 57 foods that they reacted to, this is why. So, um, well, a couple slides back is why. 
when your gut is permeable and things are leaking through, your immune system and your gut is educating itself with, about what's foreign and what's not. And it's causing an inflammatory response against random things because it doesn't know what they are. They're in a place where they shouldn't be. Um, so the food sensitivity test is a whole another topic for another day and why they're not super helpful. But um, essentially what that's showing is the gut is mad um, and the gut is permeable and we need to calm down inflammation in the immune system. Um, and oftentimes that actually starts with managing stress um, and improving digestive function. So um, especially for our patients, giving them a list of 57 different foods that they can't eat amongst the foods that they already don't eat is not a great idea. But again, it's not a long-term solution. Um, the reason that all those foods are on there is showing a sign of a deeper issue. So there are lots of types of stress, like I've mentioned throughout this entire thing. Um, we can have physical stress, maybe an injury um, or from surgery. We can have psychological stress, psychosocial stress, um, physiological stress, which includes under eating. So when you're assessing your patients, what I call stress bucket, you can think of it like a bucket. Um, you wanna be emptying that stress bucket as fast as you possibly can. If you aren't, it's overflowing. And that overflow of stress can lead to digestive issues down the road. This is actually something that I posted on Instagram the other day that was super applicable to this. So when your clients are under eating, um, that is a stress to the body. The gut slows down digestion, your thyroid slows down, which further slows down gut function. Then your adrenals are stressed out, um, creating cortisol, which then affects your gut function even more. So often, like I mentioned, the root of this is one, eating enough, but two, reducing stress um, from all angles um, of whatever the client is going through. So really the takeaway partially is before we start addressing digestive issues, we really have to get their organ systems um, and the brain back online. It is impossible to improve this digestive disconnect if someone is in a chronic fight or flight state under eating, over exercising, et cetera. So really the first step is making sure your client is eating enough calories for their body um, and working on getting Muted. Low hydrochloric acid or stomach acid can lead to B12 deficiency, which makes anxiety worse. So when you're stressed, you're not only affecting your gut, but it's also inhibiting stomach acid release. Um, and you can see how this becomes a super vicious cycle for people um, and can then continue to snowball with more and more gut and mood related symptoms. So when your digestion is under stress, there's less bacteria and enzyme support. Your food breakdown is slowed, meaning things are sitting in the digestive tract longer than they should be, fermenting, causing bad bacterial overgrowth. You're not in a rest and digest. Lower stomach acid um, decreases blood flow to the gut. Your immune system is less effective, less saliva, and your body's just not equipped to do all of this at once. This is another visual similar to the one that I posted um, at the beginning of this. So here's the vicious cycle. Your brain senses stress. Stress 
shuts down stomach acid secretion, your digestive enzyme ability is decreased, food enters your stomach, it's not broken down adequately, there's something called stag stagnant fermentation, digestive symptoms occur, you know, your clients that complain of like, I just feel like food sits in my stomach, it's not going anywhere, well, it's because of this vicious cycle. So that stagnant fermentation, these digestive symptoms then cause more stress. Um, and that can be for a lot of reasons. It can be from the fermentation or the bacterial overgrowth or the dysbiosis, um, but it could also be because your client feels really full and constipated and bloated and they don't wanna eat and that adds more stress. So we have to break this cycle for them so it doesn't continue to snowball um, into more and more dysbiosis and gut symptoms. So here's some things that you can apply with your clients to start. Um, yoga breathing, five minutes a day, that ujjayi breathing actually stimulates the vagus nerve. And when your vagus nerve is stimulated, that helps with gut peristalsis and movement of food and waste through your system. Gargling, super strange to recommend to a client, but gargling two to three minutes, two times a day. I usually just tell my clients to do this like before they brush their teeth or after and create it as part of a habit. This is really helpful at stimulating that vagus nerve. Meditation to get into that parasympathetic state. There are actually probiotic species that have shown um, to improve vagal tone. So specifically the lactobacillus species um, and bifidobacteria. So those can be very helpful um, to give to your clients. Um, there is something called psychobiotics. We're gonna talk about this more in part three and four, but they are a class of probiotics that have anti-inflammatory effects and directly affect the brain. Hypnotherapy can be very effective and then also stay tuned for Part three and four for more on this, but these are some easy things that you can do to get started on this, um, but really at the root of it, one, making sure clients are eating enough um, food, trying to induce positive mealtime environments, um, and then reducing stress overall. So to kind of sum it all up, a stressed out gut is a stressed out brain, and a stressed out brain is a stressed out gut. So you can improve your digestive health and therefore your brain health by reducing stress, making sure you're eating enough calories, um, and improving vagal tone. Um, your adrenal demand, so cortisol production, impacts digestion, metabolism, and even anxiety response. So really to improve digestive health, we have to start with stress management. Um, and eating enough calories to get the body out of fight or flight and survival mode. And here's one more visual about this. So as dysbiosis or overgrowth bacteria increases, food variety is limited and meals are skipped. So therefore gut bacterial diversity decreases, the gut lining becomes weakened and compromised, the brain senses stress and the cycle repeats. So again, going back to what I said earlier, we have to stop this cycle somewhere. And it's very easy to get into this chicken or egg scenario of what happened first, but starting with calming the nervous system is a great place to start. So how this applies to your eating disorder patients, if you have digestive symptoms, you first have to evaluate the stressors, including how many calories they're eating, how their food variety is, as well as their psychological stress, like I mentioned earlier too, their mealtime stress. If they're under eating or over exercising, start there. Um, try to explain to them the stress on the body and how this is affecting them. Um, I see this oftentimes with overtraining, um, even in athletes just the over-exercising and how that actually affects their digestive symptoms. Um, adding in mindfulness-based practices to improve digestive health and then have them make sure you're working with a multidisciplinary team. This definitely takes work on all angles. Again, we'll talk more nutrition-related next time, 
um, but making sure they're getting support on the food piece um, as well as therapy support as well to improve this food fear and stress so they're not creating more anxiety, um, more digestive symptoms when they're eating. So patients have stress in various forms and get a multidisciplinary team on board. So next up, March 25th, we are talking about trauma and the gut. This is one of my favorites. There is so much good research about this. Um, it's really, really cool um, about how various forms of trauma actually directly affect the gut microbiome, um, the makeup of the gut, um, even trauma related to like concussions and head injuries as well. So stay tuned for that. I don't know how much time we have for questions, Unmuted. but happy to answer questions and you can find me on Instagram if you would like to. That's where I hang out the most and share more information about this. Thanks, Heather. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Okay. Fingers crossed that that lasts because it keeps <sighs> cutting in and out. So um, fingers crossed. We do have a lot of questions. We'll get to some of them. If folks would like to hang on the line for a little bit, you're more than welcome to. Uh, we know that it's close to the end of the hour, and so uh, if you need to hop off, we understand. So I'm just going to say really quick that if you hop off, um, you will have a, an evaluation that will pop up automatically on your screen. If you'd be so kind to stay, as to answer those questions really quick before you go, that would be helpful. And then about an hour from now, you'll receive a separate email from GoToWebinar with the link to take the online test. And you must take the test online in order to uh, receive continuing education credit. So I want to get that out there really quick before the top of the hour in case folks have to hop off. Um, but well, let's jump into some questions. And uh, also let me apologize. This is Tamara Bingham Noyes. I'm the Director of Business Development here at Center for Change. You can't see me because our internet, it's a little funky today and it's not working ideally. So uh, in order to maybe have better sound, I stopped my camera. So I apologize for that. Okay, Heather, here we go. If okay. enteric nervous systems assists with making neurotransmitters, does it also oversee mood? Does it also oversee what? Mood. Mood, M -O -O yes. Mood, okay. Yes, by the way that it impacts neurotransmitter production, postbiotics, um, gut diversity, yes. Great. Are lab tests of leptin and ghrelin, I hope I said that right, effective in depicting an issue with hunger or fullness? Are, sorry, you're kind of cutting out. Are lab tests like leptin and ghrelin helpful for what? Depicting an issue with hunger or fullness. Um, yeah, they can be. Great. I know a lot of endocrinologists will um, draw those, I'm sure. Um, treatment centers will do that as well. Yeah, so that can be helpful. Okay, I noticed that PPIs can increase the permeability. Many of my clients do have GERD and so taking PPIs. What would be another option? Yes, I love this question. Um, so many people are on PPIs, which if you're not sure what PPIs are, that's proton pump inhibitors. They prevent stomach acid secretion. Um, getting off PPIs can be kind of tricky. So definitely working with someone to help your clients do this. Um, what I would say is that a lot of times people are prescribed PPIs because they think they have high stomach acid, but the reality is they have low stomach acid. So it's not fixing the problem. Um, I did talk about this in part one. Um, but getting off the PPI can kind of be um, an uncomfortable experience for your client because what can happen is um, when you're on a PPI, it's suppressing stomach acid. When you get off of it, it has almost a volcano effect. So those cells will like erupt with um, stomach acid. So the symptoms can be very intense. Um, but being on those long term can definitely affect your gut function. So um, DGL can be really helpful at like soothing those symptoms, but you definitely wouldn't want to like cold turkey go off a of PPI, especially if you've been on it long term at a very high dose. But working with someone to help wean off of it is really helpful. And then addressing why the stomach acid 
or is low if it is in the in the first place. So if it's zinc deficiency or magnesium deficiency or stress or from under eating, et cetera. Thank you. We had several questions about leaky gut not being a thing. And could you explain that a little bit more? This person says, you know, there is leaking that causes stress on the immune system. Is there just a better name for it or public misunderstanding of it? Yes. So the the actual term for leaky gut is increased intestinal permeability. So whoever asked that question is right. Um, it does the the cells of the endothelial lining, like I showed on that picture. Those cells they're kind of like teeth. So they they look like this, and when they leak, they bust open, and it causes food particles, et cetera, to get through, causes immune activation, which is what like a lot of food sensitivity tests are picking up on, is that immune response. Um, so the goal is to glue those tight junctions back together so things aren't leaking through. So the formal term is increased intestinal permeab imp impermeability. Great, thank you. How do you challenge clients to tolerate the increased GI discomfort if they are under eating and start eating enough? Yeah, that's hard. Um, well, I know we talked about the migrating motor complex both last time and this time and how it is good to have time in between meals to allow the system to flush fluid through and clear things out. Um, but what I always tell my clients is at the end of the day, the first priority is making sure you're getting enough food. So small frequent meals can be really helpful until you're able to have more space in between. Um, but as far as with the discomfort, sometimes even simple things like peppermint tea can be really helpful. Um, fennel tea can be really helpful, especially if someone is experiencing a lot of gas. Chewing on fennel seeds after meals um, can be really helpful as well. Um, but uh, even stimulating the vagus nerve before, like trying to gargle a little bit before eating to get digestive juices flowing, but just going really slow at increasing intake. Great, thank you. Are there any textbooks or websites you would recommend to do more studying on this topic? Yeah, there's a couple. Um, there is a book called The Psychobiotic Revolution. Um, there's a book, I'm looking on my bookshelf. Um, there's a book <laughs> called The Mind-Gut Connection. Um, there's lots of textbooks that are good that are more like technical. Um, I'm blanking on the names, but um, to start, the mind-gut connection is good. Um, the psychobiotic revolution is good. Um, some, a lot of, I, the problem I have with some of them is a lot of them have very, like, diety talk, and so you just kind of have to weed through some of that, um, but, like, overall, the research in them is really good. Great. There are several questions about if you have a preferred or recommended brand for probiotics. Yeah. That's a good question. We're gonna talk about that more in part three and four, um, but it depends on what it's for. So the thing to remember about probiotics is you have to match the strain to the condition. So going to Whole Foods and buying some random 50 billion probiotic is not super effective as if it's not the right strain for what you're looking for. So if you have digestive symptoms, looking for strains that match that. If you have a UTI, looking for strains that match that. There are several sites that are helpful for this. Um, Probiotic Advisor is a good one. I actually have seven published papers on this, on probiotic strains like specific to different disease states. So um, you can check those out. If you Google um, probiotics and disease, you'll see all seven papers. It was something I did in my doctorate program. Um, and there's actually a list there of like, especially for mental health, it, like anxiety. And then it says the strains that are good for it, the, pro the products that are available and even food sources of those probiotics. Great, that's a great place I think to, to wrap up today because it sounds like you're gonna talk even more about it in three and four. And I think that'll be really helpful. We also have a ton more questions and we'd be here all day. So you're, <laughs> you've got lots of folks who have great questions. The, uh, a great place to find Dr. Finley is on her Instagram page and you can message her there. It's at gutbrain.nutrition. Uh, I'm a 
follower and a fan, and I learn something new every day there. So I would suggest that for you all. Thank you again uh, to Dr. Finley, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. And we hope you can uh, join us again next time. Thanks so much, and take good care. Thank you.